What's up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York. We are back at the Alto Music Headquarters, and today we are here with my good friend, Mr. Angel of Demolition Hammer, and of course, the new awesome project, Them. Thank you for being here, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so awesome to have you here. I was just checking out the Them record for review, and it's quite the epic record, and uh, let's just give a rundown on the making of it. Okay, rundown on the making of it. Uh, let's see. So the record was pretty much already written before we even we were even done with the touring cycle for the previous record, Sweet Hollow. Um, so uh, we had already started playing one of the uh, songs, Witchfinder, that's on this record. Yep. In the last batch of shows of last year into this year. So uh, well, I I did tracking. I, we did all the tracking earlier this year. So last year, um, around November. We got a set of dates, and once it was over, Ule, a guitar player, sent us, he sent me the whole album, basically. So I had about drum tracking started in February. I did the record in two days. I did the drum tracks, and um, yeah, I had about three months to prep, about two to three months to prep for it. And uh, yeah, then once I was done, uh, Mike LaPon from Symphony X came in and did his great bass tracks. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, but the rest of the record was recorded all over in different studios around the globe, like, well, between Germany and the States. So vocals, drums, and bass were done in one studio in uh, upstate New York. And um, the guitars were tracked in Chicago, one of the guitars. Then the guitars' keyboards were tracked in Germany. Wow. So, that you know, that's pretty much how it was done. It was... Not not such a grueling process, but getting everything to work right because we were so, you know, it's, you're not in the same room. You can't go over your ideas. You kind of you're doing things by yourself basically. Yeah, and I remember a uh, uh, our singer KK was supposed to come down during drum tracking just to oversee things and how it was going. By the end of the first, he showed up around uh, just a little after lunch. I was kind of done with the day. <laughs> so he missed out. And then by the time he came the next day, which is a Saturday, he got there around 1 o'clock and I was done with the rest of the record. <laughs> it was really a day and a half of uh on the drums tracking this record. It's got to be interesting that everybody was like in different places at different times. That helped, had to maybe influence the sound of this record a little bit, right? I guess so. I mean, I don't know, because it all went to um, David Taro. In Colorado, we worked with the Cal Decapitation and a bunch of other bands, and he just he did some magic on it, man. I and mean, the, the sound of that record is him, really. I think yeah. we just we just did our thing, and he made us sound good. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, when whenever I hear stories of you know members like in different areas recording things and tracking things at different times, I'm always afraid it's going to have a similar effect as Pantera's Great Southern Trend Kill because. The rest of the guys were in Texas, and Phil was in New Orleans, and they didn't really, they were like never really in the studio together, right. so, but it's, from listening to this record, it really seems very well put together. Yeah, that, that's, that's Ule, man, Ule put all that stuff, I mean, he even, um, when he was going to send me the stuff, he's like, I'm going to send you the guitars and the click, and I asked him, I had asked him, uh, did you do any drum programming, because he's really good with that too. He's like, yeah, I got some stuff, but I didn't think you'd want anything. I was like, well, send it to me with the drums that you have in mind. That way I have an idea of reference of where you want to go. If you give, you know, you send me just the guitars, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I would have done something else. Maybe the songs wouldn't have been that way. So uh, he, the, the, all the parts he sent were pretty good, and I kept somewhat true to most of it. And I just did my own thing for the rest or whatever. He was just kind of like, here, go crazy. But you don't have to follow it if you don't want to. Interesting. So it's interesting. It seems like you had a lot of creative freedom with it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I definitely did my thing on it, but a lot of the ideas were already what he had put, and you know, I, I think it made it easier for me just to, you know, I didn't have to like uh, sit there and construct all these parts from scratch. I already kind of had a basis of where to go from, and once you have that, it makes everything else a little bit easier. You know, definitely it's like a bit of a head start. Yeah. What I've noticed with this record is I found it. With having so many different sounds in it, but you also had like, you know, with the opening track having like this weird horror movie like beginning into it and like this narrative. Is this record like somewhat of a concept record? It's yes, it's actually uh, the whole theme of the band is one giant concept record. So 
the beginning of the first one takes place right at the end of the final song on the previous record. So it, it kind of continues the story of Sweet Hollow. And um, it should be doing the same thing for the third. And uh, I mean, it's only planned out the third out the three albums. So we don't know what's going to happen after the third of it. If we build some type of steam along the way or something, then maybe we can keep on going. But uh, this is, there's a whole thematic thing to it. And that obviously determined the sound of the music too. Uh, I wouldn't know. I mean, we kind of just went darker. Like Ule, the, again, the guitar player, main songwriter was pretty much like, I just want to go heavier and more aggressive for this one and, as opposed to the first one, which is still heavy and, and fast and whatnot. But, you know, there's uh, definitely a big difference from this one to the first. Yeah. In terms of the concept, I mean, I know uh, you said Uli's the main songwriter, but do you think if like a listener were to discover the second record and maybe not have checked out Sweet Hollow, they may have missed something or they may not get it that much? Like, uh, is, is it like a movie series where you have... If, you're, if you want to take it from the story angle, then yeah, I would suggest... Going back to the first one, for sure, because like I said, it's all in sequence, and everything that is happening on Man of the Seven Gables is directly after Sweet Hollow. Yeah. But Sweet Hollow is its own tale in itself, you know? So, yeah, and a as is Man of the Seven Gables, but they are tied in together, and there are reasons that are th things that are happening in uh, Man of the Seven Gables due to what happened in Sweet Hollow. Okay. So, you know, yeah, you kind of, I mean, from a music perspective, you want to start a new one, great, go for it, you know, but the story, kind of, from the story angle, jump to the first Sweet Hollow is a killer record. Yeah. So, Matter of the Seven Gables and Sweet Hollow, being that they work off of each other from a story aspect, you also had to keep the music fairly consistent as well, right? It wasn't like you could just completely change the composition at all. Oh, well, uh, you know what? They sound like two different records. Really? They really do. And, uh, some of the reviews I've read all say the same thing. It's just an overall meaner, darker, angrier record than the first one. And uh, where the first one has a lot of, uh, you know, the King, hints of King Diamond in it, this one has less of that. Okay, yeah, I still saw a lot of King Diamond. It's there. You know, listen, it's fal it's high falsetto. What do you, you know, it, it, that's King Diamond. You, know, yeah. you can't get away from that. And I'm, I'm sure having the theme and everything doesn't, uh, uh, what should I say? Um, He's just an homage to King, man. Really, honestly. We love we love King Diamond. Yeah. That's King, it. Can't hide it. Can't go wrong with King can't Diamond. Can't hide it. It's King Diamond in a thrash metal band. That's the, the best. If, thra if King Diamond woke up tomorrow and said, I'm going to put on like the, this brutal thrash record, then... There you go. That's you got Matter is. of the this Seven Gables. Matter of the Seven Gables. Exactly. Now, for you, what I was curious about is, as a lot of people know, you play with Driven Mad as well as Demolition Hammer, and having... And, you know, you also had members of Symphony X colliding with you and other people who play in other bands. Did that at all help them at all with creating different sounds? Uh, I would say, I guess, from, I wasn't involved with the first record. Uh, the first record, the drums were performed by the great Kevin Talley. Who, you know, he's played with Dying Fetus and Suffocation and Chimera. Fantastic drummer. And uh, the rest of the lineup is the same, minus Kevin Talley, really, from the first record. So you're now. the... So like Demolition Hammer, you're the new kid on the block. With yeah, Bo. basically, I'm the new kid on the block. But, you know, I've been in the band the longest, I mean, longer than Kevin, for sure, because Kevin did the record, and then he couldn't do the tour. He was supposed to do the first uh, Halloween tour. This was uh, 2016. And uh, he couldn't do it because he already had dates with Suffocation that just didn't work out. And that's how I got the call. And then the same thing happened again sometime later in Europe. So I wound up playing with the band so much. I basically, I was just a live drummer. So I was doing the whole tour until the guys were like, listen, you're the drummer. As far as we can, we're concerned, Kevin did the record. And so far, it's been you. Mm -hmm. So you want it on the album? Yeah. Hell yeah. There you go. There you go. Thank First you, Kevin. History. Thank you, Kevin Talley. Yeah, thank for... you, Kevin, for being busy. <laughs> now, uh, for you, because in the end, it is drumming. You're keeping rhythm. You're keeping beat. You know, in the end, I always feel like whether you're playing smooth jazz or you're playing grindcore, in the end, there's a similar, like, goal and a similar aspect behind drumming. But playing with Demolition Hammer and Driven Mad and them, is there, like, a different mindset or mind frame that you are in? For sure. Each one calls for different things. Um... You know, it, I took some time off from German Mad for a little bit because I was so busy with them and Demolition Hammer. So when it came back time to 
go back and do like we did like two shows earlier this year during that to go back and relearn that stuff it was I had a little bit of trouble just because I wasn't playing the style in German Mad is different than it is with Demolition. Like Demolition Hammer's more staccato and it's more like, you know, in your face. Whereas them, you know, it's got that type of vibe, but you know, there's all these weird atmospheres going on. So it's it's uh, busy in a different aspect. And then with German Mad, same thing, it's something else, you know. And uh, I had a hard time relearning those songs and playing those songs because you're in a different mind, mind, mind frame when you, from project to project, or from studio to studio. So I had to go back and relearn drums to a record I had tracked, like I think like two and a half years ago or something like that. And I was like, what the hell, you know, what the hell was I doing? When, you know, this sound like, what was I thinking with all the fills? And there was some polyrhythm stuff. And so, uh, yeah, you definitely have to be in a different uh, mindset. I have another, I have a, I'm recording this project with some dude in a couple of months and it's insane. The music is nuts. And it's, it's a mind frame that I've never been in. So um, it's going to be interesting to tackle that. You have the formula all drummers have in a metal scene where every drummer is usually in at least 10 bands or something. You got to pay the bills, man. <laughs> you know? In my, my For my case, yeah, I got to pay the bills. You know? I wish I could just, you know, be rich and just play with band, a bunch of different... I'd be in like 20 other bands. Like, no, <laughs> that was the case. <laughs> well, God, I could, my feet and arms are hurting thinking about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all right right now. You know? They may hurt if I was in 10 or 20 other bands. But. Now, does working with different bands ever help you? Like, does maybe experimenting with Demolition Hammer help you bring in some newer elements to them? Or does maybe playing with them and Demolition Hammer help enhance the live performances when doing shows are driven mad? They're, they're very different from one another. Like, those three bands are... Even though, like, you know, yeah, there's, you got the polka beat, all three bands have, excuse me, a variation of the polka, polka beat. Demolition Hammer being the fastest version of it that I play. But, uh, I mean, just endurance stays up, but there's a, uh, the difference between Demolition Hammer and the other two bands is that there's a, a finesse behind it. And there's, you know, it's not always 110. Sometimes you have to play with the dynamics of the kit and being musical. So, you know, I'm, tend to be a little musical with Driven Mad and definitely be a little more musical and melodic with them. With Demolition Hammer, it's just go through the snare drum, go through the bass drum, you know, for an hour and 10 minutes. Wow. So uh, I, I, I guess endurance is the only thing that really, but I mean, it's a, like, you know, you gotta, I listen to a lot of different music. So I always have a different approach to what I get. And, um, I forgot what was the question. I got lost. Yeah. Right going through no, the no, keep set. going. Keep going. I um, love it. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, uh, being open-minded, man, and listening to different types of tunes. And yeah, you can get something, like I said, like endurance is one thing that helps from playing in a band like Demolition Hammer. Because it is fast, and it's physically demanding, and it goes on. And, and them is also physically demanding. But, uh, you know, for example, like if there were there was some points last year where I was literally flying, doing a fly-out date, or like two dates with Demolition Hammer, coming back and three days later flying back out to go out on a run with them. And I was on fire <laughs> by the time I got to the them run, you know what I mean? Because I had already been playing with Demolition Hammer with the preparations for that and then the shows and then going home, practicing at home for three days just so I don't lose that, you know, that stamina and endurance and then fly out and I was just a machine, you know? Well, and vice versa. It worked out vice versa, too. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine. I mean, being that them has some slower songs, I can only imagine you're yeah. ready to just, like, go at it. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, got to slow down. You got you to chill out. You know, dynamic. like, again, dynamics. It's got slower parts. You yeah. know what I mean? There's, like, things like ghost notes and all, like, these, like, little symbol nuances going on in them that Demolition does. Demolition Hammer does not have. Yeah. I can almost see, like, the front, man. You ever see the movie Whiplash? Almost being, like... Not my fucking temple. Yeah, I guess so. I have never seen the movie, but I believe you have heard about it. Plenty. <laughs> yes. Now, um, what I've also noticed about them is from reading about you guys and looking up about you guys is that them also has like a uh, imagery behind them, like with the stage presence and you know your the, the makeup that's utilized and everything like that. So, does that did that? idea just come from the music that you made that idea was set from the get-go it was from the get-go i mean it wasn't my idea that was again kk the singer he uh him and uh him and uh ule ule ulrich again the guitar player 
they met up. They were the two that met first. Like in 2000, like, I don't even know, 2010 or something like that. Wow. And they talked about this project. So it was a time coming, and, you know, they went, went through it. But the idea was set by KK. Like, he had this idea, like, okay, there's got to be this, outfits, and there's going to be props on stage, and there's going to be actors. This is a story. Go big or go home. So that was set how it was from the get-go. And I kind of just came into it. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a pain, but it's fun. You, know? <laughs> you see footage, it was like, wow, there's a lot going on. You don't realize how much is going on. You're sitting there back behind a kit, just manning everything, holding it down. And there's a couple of times, like, I don't know if you've seen footage, but we have, uh, there was a character from the first rocker named Henrietta. And there was a couple of shows where, like, from my drum kit, I had to, like, escort Henrietta <laughs> onto the, and she's an older, an older gal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's just interesting to me. She fucks people fun. up in the pit afterwards? No, 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 <laughs> Henrietta, no, no. Everybody loves Henrietta. She's the best. <laughs> Love you, Angela. <laughs> you watch this. <laughs> well, um, it's I've always found it interesting because when you take a band, whether whether it's Slipknot or King Diamond or, I don't know, like any of these bands that utilize a sense of imagery where it's not even just about the music, but it's overall about the show, that has to make playing this stuff live a completely different experience than when you're mm -hmm. practicing it. Uh, yeah, sure, I guess. I mean, the rehearsals for the shows with them, it's basically, we do about two days of rehearsals before a tour, so we all fly out to Germany, because it's all been European runs. For example, when we did in the U.S., we all went to Long Island, and uh, the rest of the guys flew in, and that one we did a, about four days of rehearsal. It was the first time we even met each other. <laughs> you know, it was like, hi, how are you? I'm Angel. Hi, I'm Ule. Hi, I'm Marcus. Okay, let's go and play these these songs that we've never played together ever. <laughs> and um, everyone's a pro in the band. You got to know your part, so everybody knows what they have to do. So when you go in, there's no oh, can you go over that part again for me? Or no, there is none of that. You're gonna go in. So far, every rehearsal that we've ever done, and this is with like months of gaps in between between them, we go and we got to the set in the first shot. You know, like. Flawless, damn near flawless. It's like, all right, we got the kinks out, now we'll do it again. Now, while that's happening, there's actors. Like I said, there's characters in these stories. Like, I don't know what the characters are going to be for the new one and how that's going to work out. But um, they'll be in a different room, and uh, KK's doing this thing with them and talking about, you know, basically going over, this is what you're going to do during this part of the song. While they're doing this, this is what's happening. Well, that's going on. We're rehearsing. Then we do a full band. With the production going on in the background and going over the cues and everything, and uh, it almost seems like it's practicing for a movie just as much as it is for a band. Almost, man, almost. And now for this, this upcoming tour, things are gonna get a little crazier. As far for us, we're all gotta play. I think most of us are gonna play to a click live because there's all there's a lot of like thematic things going on in the record, like all these like sequencers and like background stuff. So some of it's gotta be triggered live and. It's gonna be interesting this next door, but I think everybody's gonna be in for something, you know. Definitely, we're gonna we're putting in our work for it for sure. Definitely. And the final question I wanted to ask you about the sound of them is having, you know, I saw elements of thrash, elements of power metal, elements of symphonic metal. Like I was telling you before, you could it could be for fans of King Diamond, it could be for fans of Testament, it could be for fans of Epica, you you name it. Do you think that by utilizing all these different sounds and having all these different images that this music can really appeal to multiple audiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, I remember I played it for a friend of mine a couple of months ago. Uh, it wasn't even pressed or pre-orders were available yet. I had my copy of like, hey, here, this is it. Finish. Oh, Check you it leaked out. it. <laughs> well, no, I played it. I went to my buddy's house and I played it for him. And he's a very uh, very picky individual. And he, listen, he's one of those guys, oh, this, this project you're playing on sucks. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he's one of those. Like, he doesn't yeah, everybody need, needs a friend like that. Right. And I played him the record, and he, he sat there, and he's like, I actually enjoyed that. He's like, I'm not, I'm not a super fan of it, but I wasn't miserable listening to it. He goes, there's, I noticed that there's something for everyone on that record. If you like, you know, black metal, there's some black metal riffing going on. There's, there's blast beats in it. If you like thrash, Megadeth, you know, whatever, Slayer, it's got all these little elements in there. And, of course, who doesn't like King Diamond or Merciful Fate? That's there as well. You know what I mean? It's just a, a little something for everyone. That's the best way to describe it. It's very dark, 
in atmosphere the whole way through. Yeah. Yeah. And well, it never lightens up. Yeah. That's what I've noticed when listening to the record. It seems like, you know, like it, it's, there's differences. Like it seems like each song does play by its own rules sure. and like every song leads up to another, but if there's anything that is consistent with it is, it is the darkness. That it's very dark. It may get, it may slow down a little bit. The record, you know, has its slow moments, but yeah. it still stays very dark and very, uh, atmospheric through the whole way through yeah definitely. i'm very proud of it you know really yeah, it's as you should a, be it's a piece of work when i heard it i was like wow i can't believe like that's me i can't believe i'm a part of that you know yeah. and then we've been i've been kk keeps sending me like reviews because the record's getting really good reviews and like the pre-orders are actually doing pretty well it's better than we expected so we're kind of sitting there like damn like this is it, it's a good feeling you know i'm not saying that superstardom is around the corner or anything like that but just that the things that it has achieved so far and if it doesn't go beyond that it's okay yeah you know well it, it's funny because like one thing that i really think is having such an one advantage i think you guys have by having so many different sounds is you could do a tour with a king diamond you could do a tour with a band like within temptation you could tour with a band like slayer i feel like it has all these different elements that could appeal you know you take a traditional death metal band they're probably are just going to go out with other death metal bands and that's fine but here i really don't see them being very pigeonholed yeah i guess we'll see we'll see what happens down the line if you know you see us touring with suffocation you know what i mean or that would be awesome but then kevin tally might come up and take your place well, kevin's not playing drums with suffocation anymore oh yeah he's been gone for quite some time now oh fuck yeah. whoopsie kevin rules though kevin you still rule <laughs> Well, I mean, I thought maybe that they're doing, like, a, the Farewell to Frank tour, that maybe they'll do, like, a... The farewell to Kevin tour? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, um, I think Eric Moradi is playing drums for them now. He did the last record. Killer drummer, killer yeah. dude. Eric, you rule, too. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, the, the godfathers of technical death metal. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't, wouldn't say there's so much technical. Oh, but, come uh, on. Those riffs, Terrence... La bum, later bum, on, bum, no. Bum, well, no, bum, later, bum, la bum. later on. But they're not, uh... They're a riff band, dude. You know, it's it's all all about the fucking Terrence. You know, yeah. Terrence and previously Doug Cerrito and Guy Marchese, and now they got a uh, Charlie Arrigo. And dude, it's, it's riffs. Yeah. That band is riff. They're in my big four of death metal. I don't know what your big oh, four. Yeah, for sure. Them, Deicide, Morbid Angel. I got one more. I, mean, I would say Cannibal. Yeah, man. Yep. Cannibal. For sure. Cannibal Corpse, Deicide, sure. Obituary. But then you can say Obituary, Death. Dude, I mean, the death, I never considered death metal anyway. No, I, I've always thought that death is to death metal is like what Black Sabbath is to an extent. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, I mean, they were more, listen, they started out as a death rash band, if you ask me. that that Yeah, you know, they had the first three records. They were more like Sepultura records. to me. I feel like them and Sepultura were really the two bands. That yeah, out. yeah, I guess so. Like something along those lines. And then death changed. You know, Chuck went on to do something else. And, you know, he pioneered what is like progressive death metal. You know, like, they were the first guys to do that, along with, like, you know, Cynic and Sadist and all those other bands. Um, well, Pestilence is another band to mention who, who did that stuff. Yeah. But uh, definitely not death metal. I don't remember ever hearing a bomb blast in a death song. Well, would you could say a lot of people <laughs> call bands like Dark Tranquility or In Flames or Soil Work or At The Gates death metal, but I'm like... Mm. Well, that's a Swedish sound. Swedish death metal. Swedish. You know, that, 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 that's its own thing, man. And that, that's really about the guitars anyway, man. They had that weird... Uh, I think it's the vocals and it, that stuff. The vocals and, you know, that, that what they call the Gothenburg sound. Yep. You know, that, the, the strange melodic riffs, but the vocals were so, like, angry. And the drums were, you know, borderline brutal thrash, really. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna go on a rant. This is gonna turn into a podcast. It, yeah, we, we could have done that, man. Talking about music, talking Total, about I, death metal. Yeah, death metal, whatever, dude. Yeah, it's all good. You want to do you want to do a part two with that? Let's do a part two with that. All right, that wasn't planned, but you heard it here on Heavy New York. <laughs> Everybody, we are here with Angel of Them, Demolition Hammer, Driven Mad, as well as the twenty seven other bands that he's in that I <laughs> can't even remember. Be sure to pick up Monument of the Seven Gables, I Manor. Guess. Manner of the Manner of the Seven Gables. Manner of the Seven Gables. Monument of the Seven Gables. That's cool. Monument. Manner. Manner of the Seven Gables. Well, no, Monument has been used so much now in so many bands that it's just like permanently burned in. So. Gotcha. It's okay. Honest mistake. But yeah, Manner of the Seven. Manner of the Seven Gables and pick up Sleepy Hollow. 
Uh, Sweet Hollow. <laughs> I did that. On yeah, okay. Purpose. Sweet Hollow is the first record. Check that one out if you care about the story. If you like, you know, following the story, Sweet Hollow. That's where it all begins. And then now, uh, Man of the Seven Gables comes out this Friday, the twenty seventh. Yep, twenty uh, sixth. Twenty sixth. And um, pre order it if you like, or just pick it up on Friday. And uh, I hope you enjoy. It. Those who have pre ordered it and. I hope you get a kick out of it, and hopefully I'll see you guys on tour yeah. next year at some point. Hopefully we'll do the States. And that was next. Any tours you'd like to promote with it? Uh, no, I mean, uh, as far as them goes, we're not doing anything till uh, I think May and June is getting booked up as we speak. Awesome. So that is the plan. We're going to go lengthy on it, and that won't be the only time we'll be in Europe. But we're going to try to hit the U.S. again. Sorry, guys, but uh, Europe just rules all the way. Like, if they, they got it down. They show, <laughs> show their support. You know, bands are taken care of. And U.S., we, we got a lot of growing up to do with how we treat the scene and going out go, going out to shows, you know, for sure. Go so, out to shows. Go out to shows. Support local bands. Do, you know, just fucking go out, you know? Nobody goes out. Especially Europe, if you're in New York City. You're yeah, in the greatest Europe, city. Europe, everybody fucking goes out. Everybody has a good time. And... It's a blast. That's why we've been there so many times, and we just only did the one U.S. run, and we never returned because it just worked out, and it was less expensive, believe it or not, to go out and do a European run. Well, you there know? you go. So that's what we're going to do again. And with that being said, we'd love to come to the States, and there is some interest. So we'll see what happens. You know, you not... Count me being there. Appreciate it. Yep. Definitely appreciate it. But thank you, Angel. Thank you for having me, man. And be on the lookout for part two because we're going to talk death metal now. Talk death metal.